North Carolinians have always had a love-hate relationship with clay. Clay is everywhere. Under our tires. On our feet. Yuck. In our walls. Under our feet. Covering our factories in monuments to the national pastime, surrounding our children, and we sit on it. Everywhere you go in North Carolina, you'll find clay. Mostly red clay, but there's also gray clay, white clay, and many other clays. In fact, North Carolina is stuck in clay. Clay. Inorganic mineral compounds can even teach us lessons. This is one of the most famous potter's wheels in North Carolina. It belonged to Ben Owen, Master Potter, between 1959 and 1972. Ben used North Carolina clay on this wheel, and it taught a lot of lessons, including pride and humility. I first met Ben Owen when I was a freshman in college in the fall of 1964. The first sound I heard when nearing his shop was the smashing of baked clay against a wall. When I asked why he was throwing pitchers and plates against a wall, he pointed to a seal on the bottom of each piece in front of him. It read, Ben Owen, Master Potter. He asked me, would you put your name on something that you know is not right when you know you can make it better? Ben Owen's rhetorical question typified the pride that was and is North Carolina's Potter Farmer legacy. Few potters ever got rich, but the pottery and the seals attached to it are as much a part of North Carolina's heritage as pine trees and dogwood. Clay of many types has helped define civilization. Artistic and utilitarian objects made from baked clay date back 5,000 years in China and in other parts of the world. Few places on earth, however, have more clay and more types of clay than North Carolina. Clay pots and vessels have been used by American Indians in this region about 3,500 years. Cooking pots were so durable that they lay directly in the coals. American Indians also used clay as art long before the first Europeans arrived. With so much clay in our history, have you ever wondered where clay comes from? And what makes clay plastic or malleable? When it comes to questions about North Carolina minerals and geology, I generally start with Dr. Chris Tacker curator of geology of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I asked Chris about the origins of North Carolina clay. Water is some pretty nasty stuff and so weathering in the southeast is very intense. In the mountains in the Piedmont the rocks have weathered very deeply. You know back behind me they're weathered to about 20 feet and most of that weathering turns those rocks into clay. In the spruce pine area, you have kaolin, which is a nice white clay that you can use in making china. In the rest of the Piedmont, you have a lot of red clays that you can use for other things. What most people are familiar with in the Piedmont and in some places in the mountain are red clays. Now the reason they're red is they're kind of rusty. They have iron 3 plus, which is part of a mineral called hematite, which is essentially just rust and it'll stain anything. In the mountains in Piedmont, clays form from weathering right there in place. 
But in the coastal plains, all of the clay that you find has been transported there by water. In still calm water, the fine grains of clay will precipitate out. So in a big stack of sediment, sedimentary layers, you'll find one bed of clay that stretches for miles sometimes. Here are some clay deposits near Cameron and Cander, North Carolina in the southern Piedmont. Note the starkly defined layers. Chris told me that to geologists, clay can be two things. First, they are extremely fine particles, perhaps one-fiftieth the size of the finest grains of sand or less than one thirteen thousandths of an inch. Clays are also a slippery family of minerals known as sheet silicates. Clays fall in a family of minerals that are called sheet silicates that are essentially infinite sheets of silicon and oxygen that are parallel. And depending on what you've got between those sheets, it, you may get different properties out of the mineral. Micas are a kind of sheet silicate. They're fairly brittle because they're bound together fairly tightly. With clay minerals, the sheets are bound together very loosely, plus you have very small particles, so you've got something that's incredibly greasy and slick, but it's also something that can be formed very well. When you combine the small grain size of a clay with the atomic structure, you have a material where all the particles will stick together fairly well. That gives clay its cohesiveness so that you can form it very nicely. Clay minerals have a great affinity for water, and some can double in thickness when wet. Ever noticed how a riverbed cracks when it dries? That's clay. Walls built on clay soil can also crack because of swelling and shrinking. Clays are a really interesting substance, but you can have too much of a good thing. You need a certain amount of clay in a soil for it to be good for agriculture. Clay will hold water and hold the ions that the plants need. If you have too much clay, though, water will not percolate through it, so any roots down there don't get fed water. The origins of North Carolina's largest clay deposit date back to a time when continents separated. About 200 million years ago in the Triassic, North America and Africa began to rift apart. And as they did, rift basins formed on both sides of the Atlantic. These Triassic basins are very broad and flat, and they have very shallow lakes. In North Carolina, those shallow lakes filled in with clay. They're nice and quiet lakes. And this is where you find the most economically important concentrations of clay in North Carolina, Triassic basins. In one North Carolina location where poor clay soils were once a curse, economic prosperity is now harvested. One of the larger Triassic basins in North Carolina is the Durham Subbasin. It stretches about from Raleigh to Chapel Hill. Ironically, it wasn't good for very much. The soils didn't perk very well, so it wasn't good for farming, and it wasn't really good to build on. And since it wasn't good for anything else, they put Research Triangle Park out there, which has been very successful use of a Triassic basin. So if you want to find a Triassic Basin, it's RTP or the Raleigh-Durham Airport, they're right smack in the middle of the Triassic Basin. After visiting Chris, I went back to the place where I first became enamored with clay to visit Ben Owen III the grandson of my friend of many years ago, Ben Sr. Ben Owen III is in his own right an accomplished artist and craftsman, but also a man with an extraordinary grasp of the physical properties of clay. Before discussing his relationship with clay and fire, I asked Ben about his heritage and the craft that defines the communities lining North Carolina Highway 705, known as the Pottery Highway, running through Seagrove, North Carolina. The early settlers that came to the, this central area of North Carolina found that they also had, they had plenty of farmland that they could use to grow crops and things, staple items for the home and make a living, but also some of the people that came, came with the talents from England and other countries in Europe and they came with the talent of making pottery. 
So the, they found that the clay that they could dig in the local area was easily usable for fashioning pots for a staple or everyday use. They could store milk or juice or um, even when they eventually produced whiskey and other things like that. But they had a way of storing the things that they did by farming. And they could also trade with merchants and, and other craftsmen in the area, such as a, a basket maker or a fabric maker or somebody that could make clothes. So they bartered a lot. Our family's early history and, and the involvement with working in clay in this community has been very rich over the years. and. It, there's a lot of influences from our early forefathers that settled in this region. Uh, some of the earliest uh, people that we've found to move to this area were from the Craven family and the Cole family. Uh, also the Allman, Luck, the Teague family, and McNeil family. And there are many others that settled in this region or outside just the local Seagrove area or Jugtown area it's called. But our family, or at least my influence, has been through my grandfather, and my grandfather was influenced by his father, uh, Rufus Owen, and, and we also have J.H. Owen, who is the, the grandfather to Vernon Owens over at Jugtown Pottery today. And we all have a very rich history in, in pottery, and we all approach clay in a different way. But I learned early on from my, my dad and my grandfather when I was about eight years old, and, and they really taught me a lot about how to look at form and design when looking in, about making a particular form, whether it's a pitcher or a bowl or a mug or a pair of candlesticks. So when you make something like that, you want to try to keep it, keep it simple. And one of the common things that my grandfather repeated to me over and over was, it's easy to make things in life complicated, but it's hard to keep things simple. I wanted to know more about the farmer potter tradition in the area. Many of the early settlers in this region, being farmers and also potters in this region, many of them uh, proclaim themselves as farmers, but during the off season or the winter months when they could not grow crops, they tend to, uh, if they were talented in making and fashioning a pot on the wheel, they would tend to make more of the pottery that time of year. But some people were more full-time potters. But uh, farmers would tend to till the ground and they could find particular clays or, or find that they grow good for crops. But some, some lands would not work really well for crops, but it was really just good for, for a potter to make pots out of. There are two main pottery forms in the region, earthenware and stoneware. I asked Ben to explain the difference. Early on, they really made and fashioned the earthenware clays. And the earthenware clays were easier to, to uh, bake or fire in the kiln uh, because they went to a lower temperature and they used early types of glazes were lead glazes. But then the stonework clays became more prominent in this area in the 1800s and they could make a much harder type of piece of pottery and more durable for storage. But baking and cooking tend to be better for the earthenware type pots because they could withstand the temperatures of being cooked or baked in a wood burning stove. So an earthenware clay is going to have a much higher iron content and it tends to be more yellow or red in, in tone. And the stoneware clays are going to be more blue to blue gray or white in color. One of the best places to learn about potters and their traditions is at the North Carolina Pottery Center in Seagrove, North Carolina. Here you will see utilitarian forms, butter churns, and kitchenware. pottery tombstones that were once common in the region. And my personal favorites, the whimsical face jugs. Just down North Carolina 705, is another museum at Jugtown. Here in the 1920s, two people, Jacques and Juliana Busby, brought a new dimension to the Seagrove tradition with new shapes, glazes, and marketing techniques that included a shop in New York City. Ben Owen Sr. worked with them into the 1950s. Today, Vernon and Pam Owens carry on and refine the Jugtown tradition. 
their wheels produce a symphony in clay. Like most other potters, Ben is also an amateur geologist and a student of clay's unique properties. So when we make a particular clay body, we take real fine clay, medium platelet clay, and real coarse clay, and we combine them together and we make it into a, a more homogenized type mix. And from there, we have to go different places to find different types of clays that will fill those applications. Ben showed me an old hammer mill or feed grinder at his shop, where he and his apprentice, Caleb Wyatt, grind local clay. We also visited the chicken house of a friend in the Seagrove area, where stoneware clay is dried before grinding. It is then mixed, weighed, and prepared for the wheel. But we take pride in looking, using some of the local ingredients from our area like our forefathers did. Giving it a rest is a, an important component after you mix clay together. I, I guess it's kind of like making a coconut cake. You make a coconut cake and usually it doesn't taste as well the first day after it's been made, but after about four or five days it gets better. Then in the hands of a modern master like Ben Owen III, clay is transformed into traditional utilitarian pieces or into exquisite contemporary art that graces homes and galleries far beyond North Carolina. But let's not get ahead of our story. What happens to pottery fresh off the wheel? And then the pot dries for a, a period of a week or longer depending on the size of the piece. And from there we will place the, kiln, place the pots in, a, in what we call a bis firing and we use electric kilns primarily for that and secondary we use gas kilns for much larger pieces. And from there, the bis firing process will actually burn any or organic materials out of the clay and actually make the clay harder. And from that step, we take it up to about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and tempers the clay. Glazes are applied to bisque fired pieces before they are refired at even higher temperatures. Traditional colors were earth tones, including yellow, orange, green called frog skin, and brown called tobacco spit. There were also blues, whites, and mirror black. Today, Ben and other area potters have formulated their own vibrant colors and glazes utilizing old and new technology. Of all the glazes, none is more fascinating than salt glaze, caused by the mixing of ordinary salt with great heat. And most of the time, salt glaze pieces are placed in the kiln with no glaze at all before the firing. And then we take the temperature up to about 23 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and then we begin to throw salt in the kiln. Now, why wouldn't we throw it in earlier? Well, salt will actually melt at around 1900 to 2000 degrees, but it's pointless to put the salt in there if the clay is not vitrified or really tightly woven and receptive to any type of glaze attaching to the surface when it's airborne. And then the silica and the clay will actually attract that salt to the surface. And the sodium will actually build up on the surface of the pot and or develop more what we call an orange peel texture. One of the unique things about being a potter today in this community with such a rich heritage is the uh, aspect of firing with wood. The potters and our forefathers that we look back that used wood firing, uh, they did it out of necessity. They really didn't have a choice of using electric or gas fired kilns as we do today. But it's a matter of choice today that we continue using this process. You know, wood is not just any kind of wood, but it can really depend on where that tree was growing and what type of minerals are in the ground. When the tree absorbs the moisture or the water from the ground, it's also pulling up some minerals, trace minerals and other things based on the type of soil that the tree grows in. So those minerals will actually absorb like a sponge into the tree and those minerals are actually deposited as a byproduct when we put the wood in the kiln to fuel it. So we're actually relying on not just the wood itself, but also the minerals where the tree grew, but also the type of clay we use. So they're all a complete circle and far, as far as making a pot. You're having all things from nature, whether it's water, fire, or the clay, or you know, the, you know, the wood that's really affecting the, the end product. The next time you see a piece of North Carolina pottery, like this magnificent salt glazed teapot, Think about the clay, the source of wood and the minerals it contained, and the salt from the earth. But most of all, think about the patience, pride, and tradition that is North Carolina pottery. On a personal note, I want to share with you the highlight of my trip to Seagrove. Ben let me throw a pot on his grandfather's kick wheel the same wheel I stood beside in the fall of 1964. I am forever stuck in clay. Episodes of Exploring North Carolina are made available to public schools across North Carolina through the generosity of the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust.